Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining this uh, webinar, and I'm really happy that we are getting this uh, number that we were expecting. Um, most of you probably know me, but for those of you that do not know me, I'm Maya. I'm the brand marketing manager here at ITIL Labs. And it's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Alexander Mitov, uh, who is a master of public health and specialist in studying environmental effects on health. In the past years, he has been working intensively with patients in order to help them change their habits and gain better health through healthier lifestyle. And today we have Dr. Mitov uh, speaking about self-motivation as the key skill for getting healthy, healthy habits. Thank you, Dr. Mitov, for being with us here today. And we are looking uh, so much forward to your presentation. And the floor Thank is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can hear me, you can see me, the presentation, everything is right, okay? Yep. Just a confirmation. Okay, so self-motivation. So that's me, I'm Alex, uh, and I agree with what Maya said. That was right, uh, all, all, the, all the data were correct, that's me. And you, some of you might wonder, so I'll, at the beginning I'll give, I'll, I'll give just a small, short explanation. Why would a medical doctor talk on a topic like this one? I have been working with patients now for over five years, and it's not about knowledge. That's my prim primary conclusion. It's not about having the right information when it comes to your health decision and to your, and to your healthy habits. I mean, people can very easily have that knowledge, but do nothing with it. So instead of talking about broccoli and uh, lettuce and vegetables and fruits and stuff like that, and vitamin C and D and B, I'm not talking about things that you already know. I will talk in the next half an hour about the key skill. So you might have the knowledge, but you will do nothing with it unless you are able to motivate yourself. So that's why I say that this self-motivation is a key skill. And just I'll, I'll, the whole presentation in two sentences, Self-motivation is a skill. And what does it mean, skill? You can actually learn it. You can practice it. You can become good at it. Good at, at, at self-motivating, at motivating, motivating yourself. And then you can use it to change your habits. So this is the whole presentation. Or uh, as a skill, Self-motivation can easily be applied to any other field. For example, you might want to, to you might want to learn it, practice it, master it, and then use it for whatever professional development you would like. It's the same basic skill, is the skill of motivating yourself. So the map. In the next half an hour or so, I'll talk about. What is self-motivation in the first part and what it is not and why it is important. Then in the second part, I will talk about the three main sources of self-motivation. And finally, in the third part, I'll talk about some deeper and practical aspects of self-motivation. So to go straight, straight into it, what is self-motivation and what is not? So, uh, it's a skill, as I, as I said. My road, to, to explain my road to self-motivation, I have worked with thousands of patients by, by now. And this was what I, with what I started my, my talk today. I realized that there was something missing. I mean, the patient will come here. I will give them the right information, give them, you know, prepare them with books, and with a diary, so for example, I'll give them a diary and what to write and how to do things and, you know, give them all the technical data and know-how that, that are needed in order for you to be able to change your skill, to your habits, and then many would fail. So I kept wondering and coming back to this issue, like, why does this happen? And I would talk to patients, like, why did you give up? And over and over again, this same topic of 
I lost motivation was coming up. So I had to go and research further. Like, why don't we get what we want easily? Why it's so difficult? So to get from a point A, to put it simply, to get from a point A, let's say it's unhealthy habits, like you don't eat the diet that you would like, or you don't exercise, you don't do anything in terms of exercise, and you would like to get to a point B where your diet is better, or you have physical activity as much as you would like, that distance between A and B, in order to cross that distance in psychology, the energy that you need to do that, it's called activation energy, energy of activation, so that you are able to activate yourself from point A and get yourself to point B. And the good, the, the good thing about all this, what I learned and what I share with you <clears throat> is that self-motivation is a learned skill, is a skill that can be practiced, just like writing is a skill in which you, which you can develop or any other skills that you can eat, put time into it and develop it. That's how you can get self-motivation to bring it to a certain level that at that point it has transformative power. But I'm speaking about the long period of putting practice into it. Because if you start practicing and working with it, you of course you will not see the results of your practice in a week or two. You would have to spend a lot of time actually to it. And then you will be able to use it as a, as a skill. So one thing that I, I, I think it's very important, I mean, in terms of what it is exactly, self-motivation is not inspiration. I mean, you can get inspired by this talk or by some other talk or by reading a book or talking to a friend. But the problem with inspiration is that it has an external source. It does not depend on you. It can happen to you, but it can easily go away and you do not have control over it. Self-motivation, on the other hand, is something that you own. It's like your private inspiration. It's something that you can call upon. And it depends on internal factors. So that's the major, so that's, that's the major difference. And uh, there are four elements to it. I mean, I, I won't go into theory uh, around it, but I'll just explain. So these are the four elements of, of, of self-motivation. First, a personal drive to achieve, a desire to improve, I mean by this, to meet certain standards. <clears throat> B, then the second element, if we, if we break it down to pieces, the second element of self-motivation would be commitment to goals, whether they're personal or in organizational. Then the third element was, would be initiative, this readiness to act upon opportunities, and finally, optimism. So these are four elements if we would like to, 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 to bring it down, down to pieces. But above all, if I zoom out, self-motivation must be a part of a bigger issue. And this is the context. That is the context of how you accept yourself and what is your mentality. As they say, you know, it's very popular right now in, if you read psychology about this uh, you will find this term growth mentality. So what it means that self-motivation cannot just exist on its own. It cannot just fall from the sky. You, you need to have prepared ground for it. And in order for that to happen, you need to have this growth mentality. And growth mentality means that I'm willing to change myself I see myself as work in progress. I'm willing to invest in myself, to learn, to go to visit different courses, to study continuously, to put work on my, in myself. 
to, to, to work actually to build myself. So this is important because it is not possible for a person to be working with self-motivation unless they have this view on them or on themselves as work in progress. So this is uh, extremely important. So I've up to now I, I just I explained what are the basic elements of self-motivation, what it is and what it's not, and why it is so important. Before I go into the second part, I, I believe that self-motivation should be, uh, and I wanted to share this with you, it should be a practice, uh, a skill learned in school, as far as I'm concerned, if someone asks me. Uh, for example, when I studied my, my, my master's degree at Cambridge, I was expected to do soft skills. That's how it was called, soft skills course. Like you are expected to do your course, your master's or your PhD, whatever, whatever it may be. But in parallel to your course, you are expected to finish this soft skill element of your education. And I believe that in our general education, at least, at least for our part of the world, we have a big gap when it comes to teaching our children and ourselves about these soft skills and self-motivation is probably the cornerstone of all these soft skills or basic skills. Okay, so this was the first part, the part about self-motivation and why it is important. I hope I get you, I got you convinced by now of it, of the importance of it. So what are the sources? of self-motivation. If you need to ask yourself, like, how would I do it? Like, what are the practices or tips that I might use in terms of using it? So I'll, I'm not going into details about this slide. <clears throat> there is just one thought, a quote, a quote from Saint Exupery. I don't know if I can even say the name of, of, of the person uh, a writer, a very famous writer, the uh, Little Prince, I think it was. Saint Exupery is the writer of, of, of the Little Prince, and he said this: If you would like to build a build a boat, don't yell at people about how to collect wood and how to put it together and how to tie knots and stuff like that, but Teach them to love or to yearn the sea, the vastness of the sea. And once you have people falling in love with the sea, then you will have sailors and then you'll have the boat. So this is the essence of, of, of self-motivation. This skill about getting yourself to love certain things which you, which you might do not at the, at the point. So the first source. One of the first tactics that you can use in order to develop self-motivation is you can start your day by asking this question. Who needs me at my best performance? And this sentence should be either on your desktop or written on your notebook or on your desk where you actually work and this sentence should be probably the first thing you see in the morning once you start working for example like who needs me at my best performance why is this sort of source of self-motivation because at this point you will immediately connect to the people you love and that is probably one of the best sources of, of self-motivation. So if it's my family, if it's the person that I love, but I, if I use this energy of who needs me to be the, the best that I can, it is uplifting. So when you start your day, whatever it is you need to do, if you keep reminding yourself of this, simple question chances are it will help you to elevate yourself 
and be able to, to, to do stuff that you might not necessarily like. So this is the first tactic, the first source of self-motivation. For example, let me give just an example to make it clearer. Like if it is like, if you would like to lose weight, for example, or if you would like to be healthier, then the question would be, who needs me to be as healthy as I can be? And then that relates you immediately to the people you love and it gives you a cause. The second source is even more profound. The second source of self-motivation. And that is about finding your why, as Simon Sinek would put it. Like, why am I doing this? If it is like healthier habits, when I talk to my patients and when they, they tell me that they want to be healthier or they want to lose weight or they want to control their diabetes better and stuff like that. I immediately ask them, why would you want that? Like, why do you want to be healthier? And that links to the source, to, to the so-called story about myself, the, the story about yourself, about your life, about the patient in my case. The Japanese is called this, uh, Ikigai, you probably heard the term, if not just Google it. it. It means like meaning of life, like finding your meaning of life. Like, why am I doing this? What is the meaning of my life or the meaning of my work? And in that bigger picture about yourself, you will be able to find a place for, for healthier habits because then they will have a frame in which they belong. They will not be just you know what? I just want to be healthier. It doesn't stick when it's like that. But when you frame it in, in this story about yourself, then it's really, really, really important. I mean, people, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll skip to psychiatry for a moment. My wife is a psychiatrist and she's studying this field right now of so-called logo, logotherapy, logotherapy. And it's the field about, it's, it's called the science of meaning, psychiatry of meaning, of finding your why. You know what, what, what these psychiatrists say about why are we in mental crisis for so many people? Because depression is going up, anxiety is going up. And you know what, what, is, what they say? The cause. They say that there is this term, and I'll use it, existential vacuum. Like people don't know why they, why they live. And it's not something that someone else can tell you that. You need to come up with that, with that meaning about your life, meaning about your story. That's the concept of Ikigai or logotherapy or new psychiatry. I mean, once you have that bigger picture about yourself, then you can more easily convince yourself that you should live a health, healthier life. You have a reason now to go and to walk or to run and to eat that salad and to do stuff like that. But because it's not easy and there will be crisis. If you start with changing your habits, if you start with going for a healthier diet or walking, there will be, and running and stuff like that, there, there will be crisis, a lot of crisis, many crises. And when you are in a crisis, like that's it, I'm not eating this salad anymore, or I'm not, I'm not walking anymore. I, mean, I, I just, I don't want to do it. In those cases, when you have this crisis, then this bigger picture, this why am I doing this, comes into your help and can rescue you, can take you out of, out of that crisis. So when I'm talking to my, my patients, I'll tell them, like, write this down, write it down, write your motivation. Like, why do you want to do this? And they, you know, it might seem ridiculous at the beginning when you feel good. It's like, like, ah, why would I do stuff like that? I mean, but when they are in a crisis, 
and they'll send me an email like I'm stuck and stuff like that. And then I'll point them to that, like go and open that notebook, like read your motivation once again. Like, why are you doing this? So this is the second source of self-motivation. And then the third source, the first two sources are internal in a way. This third source of self-motivation is external and it is your environment. It is the people that are around you. Everything in a person is contagious. Skimsi takavsi. Our friends, the Serbians would say that, right? So this, 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 this is what it means. Like if you are with certain people, if you are exposed to them, they can either influence you in a positive way or in a negative way. And we are very sensitive. And if you are constantly with people which are uplifting you, then you'll catch that from them. If you are exposed to people that work on themselves, that try to be a better version of themselves, not to, not to compete with others. I'm not talking about competition. I'm talking about competing with yourself, inspiring yourself. I mean, your friend, and that can easily happen to you if your friends are actually doing that. So come up in your mind right now with people that you know, that you like, and are actually doing something that you're not doing at the moment. Like, for example, like they're having a better nutrition or they're having salads as, as much as you would like to have, or they're going for a walk up the mountain or running, jogging, doing whatever. Give them a call, like text them, write them a message, tell them that you would like to go out for a coffee. Like in terms of expose yourself, to people that you would like them to influence you. And this is the third source of self-motivation. Like the first one was this sentence on, 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 on your desk. Like who needs me at my best to do this? The second was the bigger picture. Like what's my why and why am I doing this specifically? And the third source is exposing yourself to people that are doing that what you would like to do. The third part, <clears throat> there are some deeper and, <clears throat> excuse me, more practical aspects of self-motivation. So as I said, self-motivation has its roots. It begins somewhere. And I would like to point this out to you because in, in today's culture of positive thinking, of positive mentality, very often we are not allowed to be dissatisfied with ourselves like feeling negative mm, that yeah that's not really acceptable and, and and you don't feel satisfied with yourself always but this that this dissatisfaction can be extremely useful and that's what this slide is dedicated to so if you are facing with some kind of dissatisfaction with yourself. You have three choices. The third, the first choice is that you can ignore it. And that's a pity because you should not waste dissatisfaction. So the first is to ignore it or to pretend like you either ignore it or you pretend that you don't like the way you, you physically look. Like just ignore it. The dead did satisfaction is there. Like you're not satisfied with the way you look and that extra kilograms that you have, you might be a little bit, let's say even obese, but you don't like that. So you choose to ignore it. That's the first choice. The second choice is you can just start crying about it. The, the so-called destructive type of dissatisfaction, like, I will never lose weight. I will always eat the way I eat. I will never walk or exercise or stuff like that. Like, I cannot do it. This is this destructive type of dissatisfaction. And no one can help you if you're stuck in such, in, in such a situation. I mean, you can have the best mentor or nutritionist or a medical doctor or whatever. 
if you have this type of dissatisfaction in which you convince yourself that you cannot do it, then no one can help you. And the first and the, the third choice with dissatisfaction is the so-called constructive dissatisfaction. You know, I'm not satisfied with the way I look, but I'll put, put practice to it. I'll change it. I'll lose weight. I will exercise. I will change my diet. But have this positive mentality, this not in the, this growth mentality, not positive mentality, this growth mentality. Like, I don't like my current conditions, but I'm willing to do these things and change it. I, the concept of micro habits, I just wanted to touch upon it because it's, it's, it's related to, to, to self-motivation. What is the philosophy here? What is the, the theory? If you start practicing with self-motivation, like don't burden yourself at the very beginning with, you know, climbing Mount, Mount Everest. Like, give yourself some credit. Like in terms of like, I want to start walking, like walking for exercise, like daily. Why don't I start with five minutes a day? Like, I don't need to start with 45 minutes today or running or doing exercise or, or doing squats for, for that matter. Like, spend 1% of your day on that new habit. That's why it's called micro habit. So 1% of your day would be 15 minutes. Nothing more. Just like 15 minutes today. But here, consistency is the key. Like, you can choose to do this new habit for five minutes a day, but do it every day. Like, no skipping. Five minutes, five minutes, okay. But just do it daily. This is the, uh, the, the same concept about writing a book. No, the example about writing a book. If you want to write a book, of course, that's that sounds like a lot at the beginning. Like, wow, I cannot write a book. But if you write a paragraph each day, then in six months, you'll have the book. So this is the concept of micro habits. And then before I finish, uh, okay, before I finish, three more slides. This is the concept of so-called self-talk. Like right now, as I was talking to you for the past 25 minutes or so, there was this voice inside your head that was constantly commenting on whatever I said. Like there was a voice inside your head, just like for us football. Like there was this voice just commenting on what's happening on the field. Like, I agree with this, or I, I don't really agree, or this is good, or this is bullshit, or whatever. But there is this voice inside your head that's called self-talk. That self-talk, the way you talk to yourself, is extremely important. Because if you decide to change yourself, and get a new habit, start with better diet or do whatever it is, or develop professionally for that matter, self-talk, the way you talk to yourself, can be either your best friend and encourage yourself like, you know what? I might not be as good today, but I'll do it. I'll get better. And encourage yourself like, I made a salad today. You know, I made a mistake that I ate that dessert later on, but I, you know, I can do it. Tomorrow, I won't do it again. And, or on the other hand, your self-talk can just ruin you. Your self-talk can be about, there is no way I can do it. I'm not going to be able to change my diet forever. I don't know why I'm bothering with this at, at all. Just become aware of your self-talk. This is my message. I mean, all these things that I mentioned, of course, in half an hour, that's, that's just too short a time. For each of these topics, we can have a whole lecture, like self-talk can be a lecture on its own. So I'm just, I know I'm throwing things at you, but the point is that you go out and research and Google them and read about them and use them. Especially this concept about how do you talk with yourself? Do you encourage yourself or you put yourself down? Uh, the environment is very important. I don't have time to talk about that. And then I finally finish with worldview. 
I'm talking constantly about this bigger picture. Well, this is the biggest picture. Your worldview. How do you see your world? What are your deepest convictions? What are your deepest beliefs? This is, of course, another topic on its own, like a whole lecture. Because our worldview is developed mostly in our childhood. How we were treated in our family, how we were, we had, what kind of relationship that we had with our mothers and fathers and older sisters, brothers, teachers, at school, friends. And we built this, this worldview, this how we see the world, becoming pessimists, optimists, believing in fate or believing in work or believing in whatever it is. Like, this is your essence. And, the, and of course, your self-talk, what I mentioned, and your ability to self-motivate will deeply depend upon your worldview. And the good news is that this is not fixed in stone as well, this worldview. You can work with it. You can develop it. You can develop yourself. These are things, you know, I'm not talking about techniques. These are not tips and hints. What I'm talking about for the, five, for the last half an hour, it's not about, you know, you do that and you do this and these tiny stuff, tips and hints, how to improve yourself. I'm talking about working on yourself, like a serious kind of work. That gives results. But in order for you to have these kind of results, you need to put in practice. You need to spend some time with yourself, like invest in yourself, spend, I don't know, three months, six months, nine months, a year. But I'm guessing predominantly, most of you are young people. I would, I, I would guess you have that time. It is worth it. If you put that time, if you invest that time in yourselves, you will see the results of it. So yeah, let me just check. Um, okay, Ooh, 50 people. So half of your company is actually here, right? Let me just check. I'm looking. Uh, uh, I'm looking for. No, Vetsu is not here. Okay. I was supposed to say hi to one of your employees, but I cannot find him here right now. Okay. So this was it. Thank you very much. Later. Yeah. No, not here. Okay. Stop sharing. I stopped sharing. Uh, the floor is yours now. I said what I had to say. So I'm listening. Questions? <clears throat> no questions? Yeah, I've got a question. Or everybody else is sleeping, probably, right? Good. Um yeah, I've got a question. Um, uh, great, yes, great, great talk, by the way. I really, really enjoyed it. It's um, very motivational, which uh, which is obviously the, with the aim. Um, but um, I think, you know, um, sometimes I think people get to a point where they, they don't even know that they want to look for motivation. It's almost like they're kind of catch 22. They're kind of lost mm. even below that, you know. So yes. um, any tips for the audience around how they they find that? Mm. Well, that's a very difficult question that you asked me. <laughs> and, I, I, and you know, that's a, that's a point where you actually lose yourself and you don't know that you need it. I mean, and it, you know, th this would be a case when people would need to go and ask for help. And yeah. th th this is a difficult situation. That, uh, because it can re you can really get up to such a point where you just don't know what to do and you don't know what kind of help you actually need. Yeah. Like, you're not even aware that you need to develop this type of skill. I, in my mind, like go out and search for, you know, reach out to, to, to a person that you would expect that will probably be able to help you, like consultant or someone, whoever works in the field that you, that you are asking help for. You know, I have a mentor for everything. I have a business mentor. I have a health consultant myself, you know, that's that's the that, that's the beauty of it. You, yes. you need to constantly be reminded by other by others like what you need. 
Yes, and, absolutely. And thank you very much for pointing that out. Because yeah. yes, it can be extremely difficult for you to be even aware that you might need this. Yeah, brilliant. I think you're absolutely right to surround yourself with people that inspire you. But uh, the tips that you've given for everyone on the talk, absolutely take the tips because they're brilliant. They really are a really good starter. So thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Any other questions, guys? When when I was a student, there was this oh. professor saying, oh, hey, here's Nicola, probably yeah. wanted to ask. Yeah. There was this professor saying that when there, there are no question, either everything was clear or nothing was, you know, just very boring. Yeah, go ahead. Um, just a quick question. You mentioned habits a couple of times during your talk, so I'm actually wondering, there's been some studies that uh, it takes a certain amount of time to form a habit, like three weeks or yeah. 30 days or two months. From your experience, does it really matter how long does it take to form a new healthy habit and mm. any any tips on, and you mentioned micro habits, so I'm kind of curious what does that mean? Um. I've, I've been following that type of uh, studies, of course, because that's, that's the center of my work, like helping yeah. people change their habits. And first of all, it was like this top, this discussion about three weeks, 21 days, that is enough. And then ever since they're expanding the period. So right now they're talking about three months in order to people to be able to change like 90 days at least. But parallel to this discussion of how long it takes, there is this discussion about the concept of micro habits. And that this concept now says, you know, just forget about one week, two week, one month, two months, three months. Try to focus on this tiny little bit. Now, whatever you want to do, just, you know, it's called the salami, the salami technique. Just chop it up. Yeah. Just find that. Because, you know, when I when I talk to patients, like you would, you immediately see the, the resistance, like, do you have a half an hour to, to, to walk? And then you would, you would see their face like, nah, not really five. Okay, okay. Do you have 20 minutes? Well, not really. Okay, 10 minutes. And now, you know, it's, it, it's becoming embarrassing, you know, at some point. And then you say, okay, three minutes? And no one can say no to that. But the concept of putting sneakers on your, you know, on, on your knee, like putting on shoes, getting out, Doing this, just walk around your building and just coming back up and doing that every day. On the fifth day, people start developing confidence because I skipped that part. This is because many times it's about the, the question of identity. How do you see yourself? And these people usually don't see themselves as sportists. Like they see themselves, I'm a person who wants to sit down. I just, I don't like walking and doing stuff like that. But when you give them this opportunity, like walk for five days a day, every day, like every day for five minutes, they start seeing them, themselves with different eyes. Like, you know what? I can do this. And they start to, they're starting feeling good about themselves. And that self, that picture about yourself, that identity, it, it starts to change. And I have seen people transform from that concept of like, nothing just like lying in front of the tv with the remote controller to becoming a person that that are running you know like marathons and stuff like that and the major difference that has happened is that they change with their identity like how they perceive themselves and i think it's it's possible but it requires work thank well, you small very steps, much Nicola. right yeah. small steps yes yeah, small steps small steps thank you well, I think if there are no any other questions, um, Dr. Mitov, I think um, I can now thank you for the great presentation. You definitely gave us some good tips on how thank to find much. our self um, motivation. And I believe it will be very useful for all of us to start following some of the um, uh, guidelines you posted. Thank you very much. See you next time. <laughs>